So I think the most interesting change is uh, the way in which we're, we're just beginning to see um, what I yesterday called the kind of call and response remix take off. So what that means is um, you have these uh, particular remixes made and then people from around the world begin replicating it, making their own version of it. So yesterday I showed um, uh, this remix that was made with uh, The Breakfast Club, the 1985 uh, film, and then um, Phoenix's Listomania. Um, and there's a particular version made. And then we found at least two dozen other implementations of that very same kind of remix that had been made by people around the world. And what this kind of signals is the way in which people see their participation as continuing a conversation that started randomly in places across the world and using the platform as a way to engage and facilitate that kind of conversation. And it's not as much, you know, when I was writing Free Culture, the idea was, wow, this digital platform freely enabling people to speak to anybody in the world. But now we see they speak, and people listen and respond and um, facilitate this ongoing development of a richer, more critical, more interesting culture. So I, I think that, from the standpoint of what's going on in the media, is what, for me, is most interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we have uh, less uh, critical voices around the world about this free uh, movement of, of free rights, free copyrights? Um, no, I, I actually think we're seeing the we're seeing the criticism, um, we're seeing the criticism of this uh, intensify in some some places. So, um, uh, you know, some particular artists like Don Henley um, have made it very clear that they don't want anybody to take their work and to do anything with it, remix it at all, and. You know, for me, this is a very interesting kind of development in the argument because if you look at the range of creative work, thinking of books at one end and movies at another end, um, nobody would say that somebody can't take my book and use it for the purpose of criticizing me or making fun of me or uh, ridiculing me or praising me, right? That's all taken for granted. Uh, but there's an increasingly strong strain in the context of film and music where people think you're not free to do that to this material. So um, that is becoming more intense, but I think it's, being, it's intense uh, in a transition because I think that they're going to lose that argument and we're going to see um, a much stronger embrace the idea of the kind of creativity that remixes. So you think they are motivated by the fear of change mostly, those people who are against? I don't know, I don't know if I would say it's fear of change. I, say, mm -hmm. I would say it's, um, they're uncomfortable in a world where they can be so directly criticized. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they live, you know, especially you know, elite musicians or elite filmmakers or actors, have lived in a relatively protected space, and, um, and, and I can understand their kind of frustration with the idea of their own music being used in a way to criticize or to make fun or to, um, you know, I must have shown a thousand times this film, um, uh, which is uh, George Bush and Tony Blair in this um, 
mock up to endless love, Lionel Richie's endless love. You know, and Lionel Richie was a Republican, and he didn't he wasn't happy with the idea that his you know Republican music was being used in a way to criticize. Um, uh, and, and, you know, in the days before digital age, nobody could have done that. Or if you did do that, you were spending so much money, you were a commercial actor, and commercial actors could take care of control themselves. Um, so I think this, you know, people are just a little, you know, kind of maybe the way in the 18th century or the 17th century, um, 18th century in France, the royalty gets angry as, you know, the people rise up and start questioning them. That's a kind of similar thing that's happening here, but it's now at the level of culture as opposed to politics and our monarchy. Okay. And when you look at uh, lawyers in the States and Europe, um, is there a tendency to um, say voices that uh, say we should stop uh, analyzing so-called piracy? How, is this a wider movement? or There's a much wider movement and recognition that the existing strategy uh, doesn't make sense. Um, I think The point in remix that's resonating inside the culture most powerfully is this sense that um, you know you, uh, you you adopt a strategy, legal strategy that has the consequence of criminalizing a generation. You better have a very good reason to have to adopt that strategy as opposed to another strategy. Um, uh, so, and it's not just in America. I just spoke in Italy and. Uh, um, this man, you know, sort of made a very strong comment in response, basically saying that this problem of criminalization of a generation of people is is profound and very uh, debilitating in countries like Italy and, and in the United States. For me, there's something deeply ironic about this whole experience because you know when I was a kid, I was like in 1982, I, in the summer, I um, I came through Eastern Europe, I came through. I came through Poland, I uh, went through um, uh, Ukraine and up into Russia and um, saw St. Petersburg, or, uh, um, what we now say is St. Petersburg or, and Moscow. And what was striking was the coolest people were the kind of black market kids, <laughs> you know, people selling uh, jeans and... Uh, And you know, you'd go, I'd go hang out with them in their kind of clubs, and they were really smart, really cool kids. But they were criminals, right? They were the criminal class. And uh, to now see in America the very same dynamic developing, you know, where the cool kids are all engaged in what is generally is thought of as a criminal kind of behavior, is astonishing. Because when I observed this in Russia, and we'd come back and talk about it in the States, it was like, this is the terrible thing about a totalitarian society, is that the most talented people internalize the idea that they're criminals, and they become alienated from society and from the state, and, and that's destructive, and that's why communism is so terrible. And then, you know, okay, fine, communism was terrible. But now we are in a free society, quote, free society, where we're replicating exactly the same kind of dynamic. and. Um, You know, and, and I find it terrifying to imagine who this generation will be in 20 years. Like, what, what would their relationship to society be? Um, and, um, and, you know, so again, if there were a reason we had to do it, I'd say, okay, we have to do it. But given that there are such clear alternatives to the existing copyright regime that could achieve the objective of compensating artists without criminalizing a generation, I have, no, I, I have no patience for the continuation of the existing system. Mm -hmm. And I want to uh, ask, move from the, the celebrity level and uh, the pop stars and the, the rock stars, uh, I want to give you an example of uh, my fellow photographer, uh, my friend, who says that The flick, for example, is a kind of uh, unfair price dumping for him because he's a photographer who works in Africa. And me, as an editor of a website in the times of crisis, when I need uh, a, 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 a story of, from Africa, I, told, I tell my workers, try to find some pictures from Africa on, flick from, on the, on the uh, Creative Commons license. So why use uh, something and pay for it when you can have it free? Mm -hmm. and Then I, I, I come to my, my friend. He says, hey, I have, I have no longer the income to, to go to Africa for, to make another story. So it's, it's kind of uh, ruining one of the way of, of living. In, 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 in. So, so what's the solution to this problem? Well, 
there's no doubt that digital technology is going to radically displace many <coughs> businesses, right? That, um, I used to have a friend who was an executive in the film division of Kodak. You know, he used to make films, print films, and he doesn't have a job anymore. You know, it's not where he works. Um, and you know, you could say it's terrible. The technology has made it so now people can take a thousand pictures on their camera instead of taking twenty-four or thirty-six and paying fifteen dollars to do it. And the response to that is, um, technology changes, and nobody's breaking any rules when they start using digital technology as opposed to old film technology. And the industry needs to adjust to it. Now, um, it is the case, I think, that professional photographers are going to be facing enormous competition from amateur photographers. Um, and many of the amateur photographers can buy equipment that is comparable and are just as talented. They have a different kind of day job. Um, my, own, my wife uh, is a Flickr photographer. Um, um, one year, she made more money selling she doesn't sell her prints, but somebody saw prints and said, I want to, you to print these and put them in an exhibition, and she did, and she made more money selling prints than she made as a lawyer in the United <laughs> States, right? So um, now you can look at the professional side and say it's terrible, but I look at the amateur side and say it's amazing. Like all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of people who are now trying to become great artists, trying to become great creators. They might not be doing it for money, but they're doing it and they're exercising that credit talent. And as much as I, you know, I understand that somebody who thought he was going to be a professional photographer his whole life and have a nice, nice comfortable business now doesn't, um, I wouldn't support rules that tried to block that. You know, what, what are you going to say? That you can't have sites like Flickr? People aren't free to license their photo photographs the way they But what about the quality? But who judges quality? But amateur, from the definition, makes... Uh, no, no. There are two very important... There's two very important meanings of the word amateur. One is amateurish, as in not good. And the other is someone who does something for the love of the work and not for the money. And that kind of amateur can often be better than the professional. You know, I'm doing it for uh, the love of what I do. This is why I'm doing it. And it's solely because of my love for this work. Now, there's some people lucky enough to have a job that's also their love. Right? Um, so they are amateur professional in one. Um, um, but many of these amateur photographers in the context of Flickr or other sites like this are amazing photographers. Um, Joey Ito, our own chairman, um, uh, uh, is an extraordinary photographer. He released a book called, I think it's called Free Souls, which is his collection of all of the images of amazing people he's been taking. Um, and if you look at that and you know those people, there's something about his ability to capture an image from a person that reflects their character in a way that a photographer, a professional photographer would come in, you know, just wouldn't know the person well enough to know, you know, with Cory Doctorow, the thing to do is to get his... You know, image from a side and above to kind of get him kind of off angle. Um, uh, so um, it may be that the amateur photographer is amateurish and, and bad. And if that's true, then when your blog looks at his photographs, he'll say, "Yeah, it's not good enough. We, we need something better." It's cheaper. It's also a big argument, especially in the times of crisis. Of, uh, of course, it's cheaper, but you know, why is it a bad thing? People can't get things for less. You know, this is if you're in a world where you've got lots of constraints, if he was forced to buy the expensive thing, he'd have to lay off one or two of his workers, right? No. At, at last, someone has to pay for the work, because when you, when you talk about the Mr. Ito case, he's a successful entrepreneur, I think, and that, that's, the, that's where the source of his income comes from. Mm -hmm. So he, he can afford to make great uh, photographs as an amateur mm -hmm. and give, give it free. But mm -hmm. uh, what with the other people? Because we were asking here, because it's the same kind of thing right now in the media business, in the mm -hmm. journalism business. We have a lot of free information uh, circling around the net, and sometimes uh, our our uh, boss tells us, "Sorry, I can't pay you because there's a, there's a lot of cheaper and free information around." Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I mean, this is a, it's, it's important to recognize this is not a new internet-related problem. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a historical problem with changing in technology that changes the way businesses, you know, the way business works. Um, and in the context of what's free now, you're right, there's an extraordinary amount of stuff that's free now that's going to compete with old businesses that 
based their business on scarcity. Economists would say the net result of that is better because it's lowering the cost of producing stuff around the world, so there'll be more you know, opportunity to do stuff, but people in the middle of the transition are stuck. So steel workers, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania, steel workers in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. used to have a great job, but now all steel is produced in Korea and in Japan, so they don't have a great job anymore. Um, um, and the constant struggle of society is whether they will do the mistaken strategy, which is to try to protect the old way against the new, or whether they'll just figure out how to make sure that the people who are hurt by the transition aren't hurt as much. Um, uh, now, in the context of, you know, like Joe Ito, or, you know, the thing to recognize is that a full life for a human usually, hopefully, involves a whole bunch of life which is outside of the market. You know, stuff you do that you share with others and you do for the love of doing it. That's like what it is to be a full human being. If everything you did in your life you were doing for money, you'd have a very narrow kind of life. Kind of perverse, too, because what about sex? Do you do sex for money only? I mean, so the point is, there's, we all recognize that we have these different spheres of our life. And what technology has done is it's enabled that amateur sphere to be much richer, much more meaningful, um, because now you can take your pictures and share it not just with your wife or you're with your best friends, you can share it with thousands of people on Flickr. And this is the thing that is compe- so compelling to my wife. Now she has literally hundreds of people who comment on her photograph, give her ideas about different ways to do it. Um, so that's making that part of her life much more much richer, much more valuable, right? That's a great thing. Now, I'm not denying that, you know, somebody who used to be able to rely upon, you know, the fact that only rich, uh, only professionals had cameras, uh, good cameras, is, is worse off. But you've got to put the whole thing together. And then you've got to ask the question, do you really expect governments or somebody to intervene to block the development of people freely doing what they want to do in a context that makes you know them better them, them better off, it's one th- it's one thing you know the standard debate in this context is about people violating other people's rights you know so peer to peer file sharing and I wouldn't just I wouldn't defend peer to peer file sharing, but what we're talking about here, no rights have been violated. People are just doing what they want to do with their money, with their time. They're producing stuff, and it has a consequence that other people aren't happy with. I understand that, but. Um, but you know, the fundamental choice is about whether you allow people to flourish. You know, like of course, we don't expect that the government will block some some <laughs> of the ventures. We just we are all here, in, the people in transition, as you said, and, and our, I think that our readers are also people in transition. So yeah. what we are trying to give them is give them some answers, so maybe an ideas mm-hmm. how to, how to change their lives now. Yeah, I think you know because I don't have any. <laughs> Political position. I don't have any anything to defend. Uh, My answer is not. Were, you were a young governor of, of Pennsylvania. I was a, a, in a I was a teenage Republican governor, which means that it was a mock <laughs> government. I was never. <laughs> um, I think the re, the truth is uh, bad for a whole bunch of people. You know, if you're fifty something and you're not willing to go back to learn how to change yourself. To, uh, to adjust, you, you're in real trouble. You, you know, you're going to be poor for the rest of your life. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you're you know, willing to, uh, to adjust yourself and try to learn how, to, how these technologies, uh, how what your particular skills might connect to these technologies, um, I, I think there's some opportunity for many of these people. But the transition is not... I would say the transition is not stoppable and should not be stopped. Um, and uh, governments should focus more on how to help people hurt by the transition. You know, the standard problem, you know, for example, in the United States, you look at the fact that we had huge transitions that affected blue-collar workers, you know, middle-class workers, um, and transitions that hurt the very richest entities, like the banks. And... When the blue-collar workers were at stake, the government was, oh, geez, we can't do anything, you know, it's just the consequences of the market, and we're sorry. Um, but when it was the banks that were at stake, you know, it was, let's run in as quickly as we can and give them trillions of dollars of money to back them up to make sure that they don't lose their second house in the Hamptons or something like that. So 
it's not that governments don't intervene to help people suffering transition. They do. But I think it's fair to criticize where they intervene because they should be intervening to help those who are least able to help themselves, not those who are most able to help themselves or those most responsible for the harm that they're befalling. And that would certainly be the, the banks in the last crisis. And did I understand it correctly? Did you say that you are against file sharing? I'm against illegal file sharing. Absolutely. Well, what does it mean? Illegal file, file, file It sharing. means sharing files without the explicit or implicit because of a CC license author uh, authority of the of the copyright owner. So, so downloading music on torrent. Absolutely, I'm mm -hmm. against that. I'm against it for two reasons. First, um, first, I don't support violating other people's copyrights. But second, I think that that behavior makes it too simple for the industry to frame the internet as just a pirate way. You know, it's just a place where people are violating other people's rights. And I think that that energy ought to be devoted to trying to push for changes in the law that would make the law uh, make more sense in the digital age. So, you know, I think that there should be changes in the law to actually render a whole bunch of that behavior legal. So, for example, German's uh, Green Party has a cultural flat rate proposal that would be a certain amount that everybody pays, and that's used to offset the harm caused by non-commercial file sharing. Um, and it would legalize non-commercial file sharing. Uh, so that would be a change in the law that would A, get artists more money, and B, change the regulation of the behavior so that the behavior was no longer illegal. So that when you did it, you wouldn't say to your kid, you're breaking the law, you would say to your kid, You know, you're always spending too much time gathering music on the internet. Um, uh, so I think that's, a, that's the kind of change that I support because I don't think the existing architecture of copyright law makes sense for the digital age. But I certainly don't support people you know, violating other people's rights. Mm -hmm. So you must have been disappointed when there was this decision about prolongation of, of the copyright. I, I could, of the prolongation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It was ridiculous. Um, when, co when Congress in 1998 extended the term of copyrights by 20 years in the Sunny Bone and Copyright Term Extension Act. <coughs> the issue had not been at the center of everybody's focus, and, and most people were surprised by it. And, but since that case, there's been an enormous amount of scholarship and attention to this issue. And the general consensus among independent economists, meaning people who are not being paid by the industry, is it makes no sense absolutely no sense to extend the term of an existing copyright. Um, because if copyright is about creating incentives, we know that incentives are prospective. That it's about the future. So if you're uh, um, Sir Cliff Richards and you get another 20 years for your copyrights, that's not going to increase your incentives 60 years ago. That's just not the way incentives work. So it's not about copyright. So then the question is, what's it about? So people like Sir Cliff say, well, what we want to do is we want to, we want to benefit people in the last part of their life. Again, if that's what you're trying to do, then talk about work going forward. You know, just let's say prospectively, let's extend the term of copyright. Um, and the other point is, anybody who today is making money off of recordings they made 50 years ago, is already doing pretty well, right? Those are the successful people. They're not the starving artists who, you know, are not making any money off their recordings 50 years ago, or now making money off their recordings 50 years ago. It is simply a transfer of money from the public to the wealthiest <coughs> artists in our society. And for what reason does a government do that? Um, uh, and the second thing that, that drives me even more crazy about this is, it would be one thing to say, okay, The wealthiest artists in our society are very powerful, and they get benefits from the state, so the state's going to give them some more money. But at least require, before you get the benefit of your 20 years of extension, that you file a form and say you want it. Right? At least require that you take a formal step to claim your right. Because if you require people take a formal step to claim their right, 80% of them wouldn't. And 80% of that work would just go into the public domain. And then we would have no question about you know, trying to figure out who the owner of this stuff is. It would be clearly owned by the public. 
even that minimal step has not been part of what is being done right now. So that, so that uh, we not only get this, it seems to me, completely economically and publicly unjustified transfer to the richest artist in the society, but we do it in a way that burdens society to benefit nobody. Because that 80% or 85% or 90% of works that nobody would have claimed an extension for now sit in a form that nobody can exploit. So, and, and this is very important um, for media, like recordings and film, right? Because of recordings in particular, many of these recordings are now captured in a form, in a format, that uh, is going to disappear. You know, it's going to be, it's going to dis- you know, can't, it can't be maintained, or it's going to be in a format that machines don't exist to easily transcribe them. What we need to be doing with this material, this you know, 20th century culture from the 20th century, is capturing and storing and archiving and updating and translating and doing everything we can to keep it alive. When you burden it with another 20 years of copyright protection, where no owner is actually even identified for the copyright itself, then you assure that it's going to sit in some you know, box for another 20 years before anybody tries to touch it. And when somebody tries to touch it, it will be unrecoverable. So this, the, it's very profound in the United States in the context of, for example, think about documentary films. So a documentary film, standard format for a documentary film in the United States um, in the 1960s, let's say, was to you do some filming, but then you take little clips of news programs. So you do a documentary film about civil rights, you do some clips from CBS News reporting about um, mayor of Montgomery shooting fire hoses on protesters. Um, when they would take those clips, they would sign a license with the um, CBS News, for example. And the license would say, you agree, you waive off fair use rights to this clip, and you promise you're only going to use it for five years for non-commercial pur- for, for educational purposes. Well, at the end of five years, if you want to re-release that documentary, or you want to release it in a DVD form, or put it into an archive, you've got to go back to that original copyright owner and clear the rights to do that again. Well, if you've got a documentary film, you could have 50 of those clips inside the documentary film. And you have no idea now who to clear anything with at all. So that documentary film cannot be reproduced. All right, so probably 90% of documentary films from the 20th century are technically illegal to transport into the 21st century in a form that we can continue to get access to because of this thicket of rights that sits around it. Uh, Now, the 19th century is perfectly accessible to us and will always be, and the 18th century, and the 17th century, and the 16th century. It's the 20th century that will be... Um, so burdened in legal rights that by the time the legal rights are cleared away, the infrastructure that carried that material will be, you know, dust, literally dust in the context of film. Nitrate-based film survives only 25 years before it turns into dust. Um, uh, Now, again, the rules that produce this nightmare were written thinking just of the 1%, the very top, who could profit commercially from their creative work. So we write these rules to benefit the 1%, ignoring the 99% of creative work that now is going to be inaccessible because of these rules. Um, uh, and, and so, as much as I kind of don't like and, and, but understand the way in which the 1% have their power, I completely don't get why we don't at least mitigate the uh, harms caused by that by filtering out work that has no continuing commercial value associated with it. You mentioned um, the idea of the German Green Party. Uh, do, you, um, do you see, for example, um, a role of um, copyright collecting agencies also in the age of uh, Creative Commons, where, for example, in Poland there was a uh, let's say battle between artists that wanted to uh, license their work under CC and um, an agency that um, was, did not uh, know what to do with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> my own view is that collecting societies, that in the 21st century, you know, 2050, there will be 
very important societies that we will call collecting societies that continue to serve the role of minimizing the burden on artists to collect the revenues they are owed. Um, I think they're going to look a little different. They're going to be more competitive. It's not going to be as lucrative for some of these collecting societies. You know, right now, just because it's so hard to know who owns what, um, certain collecting societies make an enormous amount of money just because they're the presumptive recipient of money, but they don't know who to pay it out to. So the German Gamma um, has a huge black box filled with money that comes into the German Gamma. They don't know who to give it to, and so it eventually just has to be reverted to their own members, um, uh, which is a function of the inefficiency of knowing who is the person who's entitled to this money. And against that, kind of dump all the money into the collecting society, and the collecting society will figure out eventually which of the artists it trickles down to. There's another business competing, that's developing, uh, to compete against the collecting society. And this is a business where musicians sign up with the business directly. They don't go through the collecting society. That business sells music, let's say, into a bar. They use new tech, modern technology to do it. So, for example, you just stream the music into your bar. The bar pays less because the cost of this structure is less than the cost of running Gamma, for example. And the musicians get more because the cost is less than running Gamma. So the musicians are better off, the bar is better off, and these new competing societies are becoming vibrant world effectively world collecting societies. They're collecting their own you know, set of artists, and for many uh, contexts, it's very interesting to have an eclectic <coughs> mix of new art that might be played inside of, a, inside of a bar. So I think that the real thing that collecting societies need to worry about is not the creative commons you know, people who are artists who say, actually, there's some contexts where I'm happy that my music be played for free, non-commercial contexts, I'm, I'm happy that happens. You know, I want to get my money in the commercial context, but the non-commercial context thing I, I really... That's not the threat to collecting societies. The threat to collecting societies is more efficient collecting societies that are finding ways to develop really rich archives of material that will then somehow bypass the collecting society and do it legally. Now, some countries might respond by saying, no, we're going to ban all competition in collecting societies and, and but I think the EU here has been very good at saying we're not going to permit that kind of local monopoly over this um, kind of uh, service. And to the extent the EU continues on that, I think the real threat in the long run is just more efficient collecting societies. So those more efficient ones, I think, will win. 2050, we'll have them. They will be things we all rally around and support because they're giving everybody what they want. Cheaper music um, to you know bars and things like that, more money to artists, more efficient system for understanding who's, who's using what. Mm. I have another question uh, of the sharing economy. Because in your book, Remix, you, you, you feel a, 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 a very enthusiastic for this sharing economy and the hybrid business model. <coughs> and how is the situation uh, looks here after the three years? the book was published, do you still uh, remain the same optimist? Yeah, I think you're seeing um, you're seeing much more of it. Um, it's interesting, in the internet age, uh, things are move so quickly that issues are forgotten very quickly. So I had a wonderful exchange with David Carr at the New York Times when he wrote a piece about um, six months ago. Uh, talking about the hybrid economy and the remix, you know, that kind of sharing economy and, and feeling like he had discovered for the first time this idea that there was going to be this hybrid and, and that was going to be the new future. And, you know, and I said to him, David, you know, it was only three years ago you and I had exactly this conversation about the book. You know? and so it's, it's becoming bigger and more important, but the issue that I flagged in the book... Um, I guess I would characterize my attitude in this way. I would say I'm extremely excited about the sharing economies because I think to the extent you enrich that part of our life, that's great. Um, uh, and I observe that there are going to be many hybrid economies and to the extent that creates wealth in our society, that's great. But 
the hybrid economies are going to raise all sorts of questions of justice about the relationship between the money maker and the uh, mm-hmm. people who is you know are creating the value for the company. So a lot of times you have these you go to these tech shows, and you see these you know executives get up and talk about how wonderful it is that all these people are doing this work for the company. And once in a while, somebody raises their right hand and say, in a kind of old labor like way. Um, yeah, but what about the worker? You know, <laughs> what are you giving to that person? Um, and it it's it raises a very awkward question. Um, so the most dramatic example of this recently that I think raises all these issues perfectly is Huffington Post. So Huffington Post is one of the mo- I think the most innovative new journalism site. Okay. So what what is and you know recently sold to AOL three hundred or four hundred million dollars um, uh, that they got for this. Uh, and so Huffington Post is comprised of <coughs> bloggers, real journalists who actually do real investigative journalism, and a whole bunch of, you know, here's ten lines from this article on The Atlantic, mm-hmm. uh, which you can click through to the article on The Atlantic. Um, it's a perfect hybrid, right? So the bloggers get paid nothing. Um, the journalists get paid, but they're producing value, real journalist value. And the... Uh, Five lines for the article in the Atlantic is a kind of teaser ad into the Atlantic, which is driving traffic back to the Atlantic. When AOL, when the AOL deal happened, one of the bloggers filed a lawsuit against Ariana Huffington and said, "You got all this money. I want some of it." Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and Ariana Huffington's response was, "No, that wasn't our deal. Our deal was you. I gave you a free platform, and you, in exchange, gave me content." Mm-hmm. Um, uh, now. The guy who filed this lawsuit is actually one of the most important labor organizers in the United States for writers. Um, his name is John Tassini. Tassini is a very important Supreme Court case, Tassini versus the New York Times. He won, and it was basically establishing the right of writers to um, compensation for reuse of their uh, uh, um, work later on by these large publications. So he's a very prominent and respected journalist, writer, labor organizer. But I think he completely misses the dynamic of the hybrid here because um, the Huffington Post provides real value to a certain kind of writer, you know, this kind of blogger. I, I'm a blogger for the Huffington Post. Um, the value is, as a blogger, I want to just be able to write what I want to write, not worrying about anybody telling me what I'm allowed to write, not worrying about whether anybody really wants to read what I write. You know, I just want the freedom to write. Um, uh, and... I, used, I, I have a blog that I've put into hibernation. I put it into hibernation because uh, it had become very popular and therefore subject to many malicious attacks. Um, at certain times, Google just took me off the internet because it was filled with all sorts of gambling sites that had put their stuff inside my blog. So then I was faced with this, okay, I'm going to have to pay... $500 a month to some guy who's going to monitor and make sure that my blog is not uh, you know, spam traps. Um, how am I going to get the $500 a month? I could run advertising. Oh, if I run advertising, then every time I post something, I'm going to be sitting there watching my ad meter to see whether this is the sort of thing that's getting traffic to my blog. And I don't want to be in the world where I'm focused on writing things that gets traffic to my blog as opposed to just writing what I want to write. Right? So... I just, at that point, said, I can't afford to run the blog. I'm going to shut it down. And I shut it down. But then Huffington Post comes along, and they say, here, we can write here. And they didn't even tell me how many people read my articles. I have no way to know. So it's perfect from my perspective. It's giving me exactly what I want, freedom to write independently in a platform that is accessible to everybody around the world. Uh, They get that content. They don't pay me anything. I'm happy for that. That's perfectly great. I, for many years, was a columnist. You know, I was a columnist at the Standard. I was a columnist at the uh, at Wired. I was a columnist in, um, in you know, a whole bunch of these publications. They would pay me for my writing. But every time, we'd have a negotiation. What am I going to write about? I'd say, I want to write about X. They'd say, we're not interested in that. Write about Y. Okay. In exchange for giving up my freedom, I got money. But Huffington Post says, you get freedom, no money. Okay, I take freedom, no money. Now, of course... A writer would say, you can do that because you're a law professor, you're being paid, you know, and that's true. Um, so I think the journalists have to be paid to be journalists, and that's why the other part of Huffington Post is so important, when they actually pay real journalists to do real investigative journalism. And some of the very best political 
um, corruption journalism is in the Huffington Post. Um, so Phil Delaney um, uh, and uh, Carter and Grimm, these are all people who are writing really fantastic, uh, Dan Frumkin, really fantastic investigative journalism stuff for Huffington Post, um, um, which is traditional journalism. But Huffington Post can sub-support it because they've got this wide range of other content that's coming for free from bloggers, and they're also driving traffic to other sites, which gets them revenue from that. That's a hybrid. Um, now, it's not that I don't think there are hard questions that Huffington Post has to answer. What is the right relationship to set up with the free bloggers? Um, I think they've got it right, but I'm not saying it's easy. Um, so there'll be many more questions about that going forward that I think these companies are going to have to think about. But, you know, as I report in the book, um, uh, uh, Steve Ballmer, president of Microsoft, um, three years ago in a conference in Berlin said that in his view, every successful business in the future will be, as I describe it, a hybrid. I think that's right. You, cannot, you will not be able to compete uh, effectively unless you're finding some way to translate the value your customers know into value for your company. Um, and, and there'll be all sorts of technologies for doing that. Well, I, I think that we can't say specifically where, where is the border between the sharing and parasiting. Between the sharing and parasites? I, I mean, that, 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 um, uh, where, where is the borderline between the uh, voluntarily sharing our, uh, our work and being affected by, by the parasite? who's sucking our work and using it to, to earn a lot of money. Yeah, I think that the, right now the important line is just um, uh, are you getting what you expect you're going to get for it? So the fact that somebody's making a lot of money off of your work does not define them as a parasite. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as long as you're in a relationship where everybody understands what's happening. So if I write a post on the Huffington Post, it's particularly, uh, not that I do, but particularly compelling. It draws a huge number of readers, and they run a huge amount of money and get a huge amount of ads because of that. I don't think they're being parasites, because this is the terms of our relationship. I do believe, though, there are places where people don't yet recognize the things they should be demanding. So I write about... Um, George Lucas writing this Star Wars remix mm -hmm. thing, and um, the remixers waive all of their rights in order to be remixers. I, I think that's wrong. I think you know that's sharecropping. That's not respecting the right of the creator. The creator there is the remixer. So I think that that creator ought to have the rights to at least own their remix and share their remix or sell their remix if they want, you know, under certain terms because they're relationship to Lucas. So I do think that that's an example of how you, you know, I think we can be critical and, and ask the question whether it is in fact a just relationship that's been set up. Um, but I wouldn't say it's unjust just because somebody's making money off of it. I think, you know, making money off of it is going to be the dynamic of how hybrids work. Mm -hmm. And do, what do you think of Facebook? Because they, they run the same idea. All the stuff you don't know to Facebook belongs to Facebook in terms of just on the same. Yeah, I think um, you know it's interesting. Both Google and Facebook grew very quickly, uh, and uh, and both have potential to be quite powerful bad actors. Um, but Google, from the beginning, has been keener to try to frame themselves in a way that makes us trust them, and Facebook never has. <laughs> Facebook has always been this kind of young kid kind of company that does whatever the hell it wants and, you know, pisses people off, but, you know, whatever. There are half a billion people on the site, so you can't, you can't ignore them. I'm not sure who I should be more worried about. The guy who tries to make me think that he's, you know, really going to do the right thing, or the guy that just does whatever the hell he wants. Um, I'm not sure who's the more dangerous character there. Um, but uh, I do think that there's something to worry about with both of them. And, you know, with Facebook, um, uh, they have architected themselves to keep people inside the garden. Um, and 
you know, it is what AOL used to do, you know, the walled garden, but it's much more sophisticated. You don't feel, you don't feel like you're in the wall. You don't see the wall. You don't mm-hmm. feel like you're being held. Um, <coughs> but in fact, the structure here makes it very hard for you to move out or to move your friends. And so, you know, they're going to face competition from, like, Diaspora, uh, which is, um, I think, is about to launch in a serious way. Um, and we'll see whether the public cares about it at all. You know, this is the biggest danger. It might be the public just doesn't care. Um, you know, it's completely happy to be living within the happy confines of a Facebook world where you know, have a huge amount of content but you're not allowed to share it with anybody outside. Or, um, uh, and, and then, you know, we've kind of chosen the, the bed that we lie in. Uh, but um, um, I do think that that's going to be a dimension of competition that is going to play itself out. Mm-hmm. Could, you, could you say a couple of words of um, um, how did the Creative Commons movement evaluate it since you established it, uh, what have you learned and so on? Because um, from, from the story that, that, that we, we mentioned about the prolongation of the, of the copyrights, it seems that it hasn't been uh, treated very serious, seriously from the, from the American lawmakers, for example. Because they, they made actually something that uh, is totally counter in, in a counter to, to, to what you are. Pro- well, I, I guess I distinguish between you know my my views about how copyright policy should be changed and Creative Commons. Those are two different things. Mm-hmm. Because Creative Commons builds on top of existing copyright law. And it's kind of perverse, but the more extreme existing copyright law is, the more compelling Creative Commons is. So we benefit whenever there's some kind of crazy RAAA activity, because people then think, oh, geez, we need a simpler alternative, or we need a more humane version of copyright, and that's Creative Commons. And nothing that U.S. copyright copyright law has done Uh, in the la- in the last 10 years, in the life of Creative Commons, has made Creative Commons harder. <coughs> so, to the extent that Creative... And, and indeed, the government has done all sorts of things that have made Creative Commons easier. So, um, uh, in the context of education and science, um, we've seen an enormous embrace by the United States government of the tools that we've built to facilitate the free sharing of ec- educational and scientific material. Um, Most recently, the Department of Education had a $2 billion dollar funding project to fund open education projects, all of which will be licensed under the freest of the Creative Commons licenses, the CC BY. Um, uh, you know, we explicitly said at the beginning, and I still think this is critical, we're not in the policy-making business at Creative Commons. We're not trying to get the policies changed. Um, we have taken positions that have expressed a policy preference, which we're now backing away from, some of them. So, for example, we refused to license data because we believed that the database right was a, was a mistake in copyright policy. And the resolution that's coming out of this convention is that we, in fact, will include data within the structure of um, uh, copyright uh, licenses that we have for the purpose of um, you know, simplifying and harmonizing our system to the, to the existing copyright regime, whatever our actual policy views about the copyright regime are. Um, so I, I completely concede and agree and, and lament the fact that my policy recommendations for copyright law are ignored. <laughs> yeah, that's certainly true. I've lost in a whole range of those contexts. Though, I would predict we're actually going to see a pretty important victory in the Supreme Court in the Golan case, which is coming up for review next month. Um, uh, but on the, on the um, voluntary policy side, which is what Creative Commons is, um, I think we've seen enormous success and progress and in the United States and much more in other parts of the country, parts of the world, where governments have even been more open to embrace and, and to <coughs> extend their Creative Commons Uh-huh. Now there is a lot of talk about how dangerous the internet is, so it requires our brain and it kills our attention span. Do you share some of this concern, or you are just an enthusiast, you don't see uh, dark sides? No, I, I, um, you know, 
my work from the very beginning has tried to get people to recognize that there's no guaranteed goodness in this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I first, my first book was, was written because I felt like there were so many cyber libertarians out there who kind of said cyberspace was going to give us perfect liberty and, and privacy and there's nothing governments can do to touch us there. And the argument I made in my first book was, well, that's true under a particular architecture of cyberspace, but you can easily imagine a different architecture where there's not, when that's not true, and you can easily see how governments can push for this different architecture. Indeed, if you look at the way commerce and government have a common interest, um, there's an obvious way in which the architecture develops to make it easier to regulate and control behavior in cyberspace. So there's no guaranteed picture here. Same thing with the way in which it might be affecting us. I don't see any reason to believe um, that the way in which these technologies affect us or affect our children's ability to learn is necessarily good. Um, indeed, in lots of ways, I think we already know enough to see the way in which it can be bad. Um, and, and how we respond to that changing environment, I think, is a hard question. Um, uh, now, you know, I think there's simple, stupid ways to respond to it. Um, uh, and I think it's easy to see why the, the simple responses are bad. But that's not to say that there aren't hard problems to figure out how we um, uh, and figure out how to solve them. So, you know, I have young, <coughs> I have young children. We struggle all the time mm -hmm. with this question of how much we allow them to be part of this. And I was once on a panel. It was a kind of a terrifying panel um, with a brain scientist who was mm -hmm. talking about. Um, when he first was describing how you know these technologies rewire the brain in a particular way. And then he said, you know, we're actually possibly going to face this complete social inversion. And his argument was, we now have a world where, you know, people with resources um, try to discipline their children to minimize their connection to the computers so as to maximize their education in the old style of education. So we want you to read books or to go out and to play outside and we want you to learn how to concentrate and to think for 30 minutes at a time as opposed to just three seconds at a time. Um, and to shut off all your other things and just, just do one thing. And then there are other parents, other people without resources. They can't afford to do that. They have two jobs and their kids are just going to do whatever their kids want to do and their kids are going to spend all their time on a computer and they're going to become you know, play 30 different games at the same time. And, um, okay. Now, go ahead 20 years and ask the question, which kid is actually going to be best able to compete in the future society? <laughs> the kid who's been taught how to read books and to focus on only one thing and never has learned how to do 30 things at the time? Or the kid who's learned how to play games while doing his homework? Well, it's plausible that society will be such that the person who's learned how to do 30 things at the same time will do better than the person who's learned how to do just one thing at that time. So that, you know, the rich try to train their kids to be the way the world should have been in the 1970s and produce a bunch of children who are unable to compete in the new world. And the other people have produced kids that are perfectly suited for the new world. Um, you know, as a parent, when you, when you think about that, you think, well, I don't know what to do now. You know, I don't know which way to raise my kids. Um, and, uh, and that kind of profound change that we're seeing in the way technology interacts with society will present a thousand of those types of questions. Um, so I don't think it's easy. I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not convinced that it's automatically going to work itself out. Um, I think there are really important policy interventions. Um, the work that's my, you know, the, the issue that's my focus now is, is um, and I have a book coming out in, um, in two weeks uh, about this, which is, you know, how the entity is supposed to be able to address policy questions, our government in the United States, is so deeply corrupted by special interest funding that it can't begin to address these policy issues in a sensible way. Um, and, and to the extent you believe addressing policy issues in a sensible way is a necessary part of getting through the 21st century, <laughs> The hopelessness that I'm most focused on is the hopelessness com that comes from this inability to deal with those questions. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, in your opinion, are the major threats the internet faces now? Is it created computing or attacks on the net neutrality idea? 
or political censorship in uh, in China and some other countries. Yeah. Um, well, you know, so there are, basic, there are certain things that the internet, um, certain features that were um, um, that came from the design of the internet that were essential to its success. So, net neutrality is is a is a shorthand for some of those. Net neutrality refers to the feature that says that the right to innovate is pre pressed to the edge of the network, which means outsiders get to be innovators. Um, so, you know, I often sort of point to, if you think of the history of the internet, who were the most important innovators? Um, they were all kids or dropouts or non-Americans. These were the most important innovators. Um, and in a world where you don't have network neutrality, where you've got to be a senior executive at Microsoft to be able to figure out what the next generation technology looks like. It's not going to be, well, except for the president of Microsoft who was a dropout, but it's not going to be kids, non-Americans, or um, dropouts. It's going to be the people who work inside the system. You know, and so it's going to be a less interesting kind of innovative space. So network neutrality points to that sort of future. Um, the other sort of architectural feature that I think is essential to the existing internet is the ability to be relatively anonymous, the ability to do things without necessarily having people know everything that you're doing. Um, now, these two features um, threaten certain people. So the neutrality feature threatens businesses that want to have more control over the future of innovation. The relative anonymity feature threatens governments. Um, so they, those interests would like to see those architectural features of the internet changed. I think the thing to fear is when the inevitable cyber attack occurs, massive cyber attack, what I've called in other contexts a kind of equivalent of I-9-11, but I don't mean Al-Qaeda is responsible for it. It could be just Russian you know, um, criminals who you know, have lost control of some of their bot that does something particularly um, destructive. When that happens, um, political will will be strong enough to bring about a pretty radical change to the way the internet actually functions. Um, uh, the, par the, the analogy for this is, if you think about after 9-11, um, the United States Congress passed within two weeks something called the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was, you know, thousands of pages long radical change to the way in which civil rights were respected in the United States. And people at the time asked, how did the government have time to write this thousands of pages bill right in the after 9-11? And the answer was, it was, prepared it was, yeah, it was sitting in some Justice Department drawer for many, many years, um, waiting for an event. Mm -hmm. And is there an equivalent, you know, I Patriot Act sitting around waiting for some crisis to occur, for them to roll out and to say, well, you know, the internet was a great experiment, but we can't rely on it, it's not trustworthy, we need to change it in a way that makes it more secure. And when it happens, then in the middle of crisis, the changes could very well be the sort of changes which destroy this neutrality feature or eliminate the right to be relatively anonymous. Um, so uh, that, that's, the, that's, I think, the big, biggest threat that we face right now. And mm -hmm. if I had to bet, I think the answer, I would bet, you know, the I Patriot Act future is our future. Um, there is a book by an American economist, Tyler Cohen. It's called Great Stagnation, and his main thesis is uh, that although internet revolution has brought a very much gain in happiness, it, it didn't uh, in a matter of economics. Would you agree with, uh, with, with this? I, I wouldn't qualify myself to second guess the economic judgment of Cohen. Um, uh, I do think that. You know, I do, I do think that it's fair to, to say that we see two changes happening at the same time that might be washing themselves out. You know? So on the one hand, it's hard to deny that the infrastructure has lowered the input costs in all sorts of areas of our economy. Um, so you, know, I don't have, you don't have to just think at a very practical level. Companies don't have to buy 30 different you know, programming suites to do basic functions like accounting or payroll that can now do it in the cloud and there's one place that does it in the cloud and it's all much cheaper. Um, so th there's certainly going to be efficiency gains in that respect. But the current infrastructure also invites also sort of efficiency losses 
So, you know, all of us wonder, is email really a benefit? <laughs> you know, of course, you can point to the seven emails over the past six years that have been really critical, life-changing things, that if you hadn't had email, it would have been really hard to imagine how those things would occur. But you also experience the, my God, I can't go away for a week because when I come back, there will be a thousand emails that I've got to go through, and how can I go through a thousand emails? So, you know, the... It's not clear that the technology on balance um, is providing uh, an enormous efficiency gain because there's, there's, uh, there's efficiency loss. Um, and I think that the answer to that is that we are going to develop norms for reducing the efficiency loss. Um, and um, how that shakes out, nobody can really predict, but we're, we're at the stage where we're experiencing the biggest efficiency loss right now, and, and that's why it looks pretty dreadful on balance. Um, you know, as you're being an executive at a company, making a decision about how do you control internet access in your company. Um, on the one hand, you have this norm, this intuition about, yeah, people ought to be free to do what they want. On the other hand, you realize that 3 o'clock every afternoon, 70% of the people in your company are just surfing the web and they're not working anymore because it's so easy to do that. I, know I as a teacher, face this, where I ban computers in my classroom now because... Um, I know the students are sitting there struggling. <laughs> um, should I be paying attention, <laughs> learning this hard stuff about contract law or copyright law or you know constitutional law, or should I just check my email or check my Facebook page or check you know Twitter or check search the web? And you know you might say that we ought to be giving them that hard choice and teaching them how to make that choice. On the other hand, I look out in the classroom and I can tell what people are doing, you know, and I can tell there's, you know, 20% of the class that's focused no matter what, 20% of the class that's gone no matter what, and 60% of the class that's struggling to try to keep focused and not pull back to their internet. Um, in my own life, you know, I just finished this book. The only way I finished this book was because of a wonderful program in a very um, French-like way called Freedom. So what Freedom is, is a program where you type in how long you want to be off the internet. And it locks you out of the internet for that amount of time. So, you know, I got up in the morning very early, checked my email very quickly, then I would type on four hours, and the internet was gone for four hours. And then I had this wonderful four hours of just focused writing. Um, and then Freedom went away, and the internet was back. <laughs> so I had to check, you know, my Facebook page, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that it's not clear we have the training yet to sort of deal with all of that. And that's, it's very easy to understand, to get to the view that not, it's, it's not certain this is on balance and efficiency gain. Okay, one last question for me. Don't you feel a bit troubled that uh, the Wikipedia has uh, uh, suffers uh, less and less uh, volunteers uh, have to uh, gather the content for Wikipedia? Um, <clears throat> of course. Uh, and I guess... Um, the project of, of assuring long-term viability of Wikipedia, not just financial, but also volunteer viability, is a really hard one. Um, uh, and I think it's important to solve that problem. But I think it's... I don't think you can extrapolate much from a downturn like that. Um, uh, and I have a lot of faith in leaders at Wikipedia. Um, uh, and, you know, right now they are the right kind of people to make this judgment, and so I... Um, I think they'll, you know, we'll have to work out what the 16 different interventions might be to continue to have this as a flourishing community. Um, so I, I think it's an important problem to solve, but I'm not. Uh, I'm more confident Wikipedia is going to solve its problems than the United States government is going to solve its problems. So I worry about the United States government not going to Wikipedia. And what do you think? What in your opinion is the reason for this crisis? Just enthusiasm fade? Well, we know that enthusiasm fades. You know, that's you know something. Um, but we also know there are just always new generations of people coming into the project, um, and uh, and so the question is, how do you continue to make it attractive enough to bring the right kind of people in? And 
frankly, there are a whole bunch of people I wish would disappear from the Wikipedia world. So you know, maybe those are the people who are disappearing. I don't know. We have no way to figure that out. Um, uh, but um, I, I'm not yet worried about the Wikipedia problem. There's a number of uh, Wikimedia published chapter. Um, I'm on a mission here to... <laughs> Because we have uh, in a couple of days um, the tenth birthday. Yeah. What's uh, what would you wish Wikipedia? So I I have a very specific wish in this context. Um, I very much wish that we would get together, and I've been talking inside of Creative Commons about how to do this. But uh, um, we need to be more creative in bringing people into the project of building and. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I have to actually, this will have to be the last question because I have to do something before my cab takes me to the airport. Um, we need to be more creative about bringing people into the project of building and curating the commons. So, um, you know, I think there ought to be an app that I take your picture, I upload it to the commons, properly t- your commons, properly tagged. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is when I'm sitting in tra- when I'm sitting on the plane or... Um, you know, on, the, on a bus, um, I should be able to have a stream of content that comes through and rate it. You know, this says that it's a picture of an elephant. No, this is a picture, this is a good picture of Paris. Yes. You know, so that you imagine, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are just in the kind of, you know, way in which you just want something on your screen to keep you distracted business of helping to build a more vibrant, rich, set of metadata that surrounds the extraordinary amount of content that's inside the commons, so that the commons becomes a richer place um, for people to go. So that when schools assign their students with the project of writing a report, which of course in the modern age means doing a slide deck around some project, uh, some issue, there's properly licensed uh, metadata-rich stuff out there for them to begin to take advantage of, as opposed to relying exclusively on uh, a service which is meant for the professional service, which is stock photo. You know, so, so I, you know, as I make presentations, I'm meticulous about making sure that I use material properly. And my first desire is to get freely licensed material. So I have a standard set of places where I look for freely licensed material, which I then credit properly at the end of my slideshows. Sometimes I can't find it, so I have to go to stock photos, so like iStockphoto.com. The cost of that is going up dramatically. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, I would have thought that you would continue to see the prices fall, but it is really expensive to get some kind of image to be able to use in a presentation. Um, you know, when you're not being paid to do it, I'm not being paid to do it. Um, so, um, so I still think there's vibrant need to make sure, you know, so if I think I'm a kid in a school and I want to have images that I want to be able to do legally and use in my projects, we don't have that yet. And companies aren't really helping us with that right now. So as I made a set of my presentation yesterday, um, it's outrageous, I think, you know, that Google, you have image search page, and on the left you'll have all these tags which you can select to filter the images down. So large, small, tint yellow, tint blue, Mm -hmm. um, origin, Europe. um, But there isn't a filter on reusable, right? Um, Even though inside of the search, they they have the information to know what stuff is CC licensed versus not. And so if you're saying you want kids to obey copyright law, um, companies like Google ought to make it easier for them to actually know what the rules, you know, what content is I'm allowed to use so that I can begin to obey copyright law. And to the extent they would do things like that, they would draw more attention to the sort of stuff that I know Wikimedia Commons is so obsessed for good reasons about, which is to make sure you have the rights to have the material and make it freely available. Um, And we ought to be building that infrastructure, that ecology, much more effectively than we are right now. Thank you very much. much.